Thank you. We're in a, a series of messages dealing with uh, Old Testament characters. And I'm doing this because so oftentimes I make more reference to the New Testament than I do the Old Testament. And I am fully persuaded that, especially in parenting, you want to teach your children, you want to teach your children those Old Testament stories of how God worked. Oftentimes, they give the illustration of a principle in the New Testament. They give you insight and understanding. So we're taking a few weeks here to talk about Old Testament characters and the lessons that we learn. Let me, let me tell you about this. About 15 years ago, when my wife and I and the family were raising horses, we had our first colt. And we were really excited about him. Everybody was home, got to see the little one, and we finally said, what shall we name him? And they said, Jabez. One person said, where did you get that name? Well, it was during that time, there's a guy by the name of Bruce Wilkinson was using his power, his talent, I should say, to write a book called The Prayer of Jabez. Now, there was also a man by the name of Swindoll that was in 73 preaching a series of messages, but he was talking about this particular one of Jabez was disadvantaged but not disqualified. And I wanted to make sure you understand that a lot of what I do is taken from somebody else, so I want to give credit. But what I found is, as we talked about this word Jabez, some people know Jabez very, very well. Some people never heard. Can I ask you? How many of you have never heard the name Jabez before? This is the very first time. Wow. How many of you have heard much about Jabez? Yes, I thought so. There's another guy by the name of Shaw, Dr. Ben Shaw. He does a lot of writing. He's out of the University of Albany School of Public Health. He's also assistant pro professor of Old Testament Presbyterian Theological School. But in 2002, he wrote a paper on the prayer of Jabez, biblical theolo theological examination. And I found it to be helpful in many different ways. So another way I want to say, a lot of what I want to say is coming from people like this. Jabez. Where am I going to find it? Take your Bibles and go to Chronicles, not Corinthians, Chronicles. <clears throat> you say, where in the world is Chronicles? If you're using a black Bible like this, and it's got small letters down there, it's on page 286. <clears throat> if you're using a, another black Bible that has large print, NIV, it would be on 277. If you're uh, in your own Bible, you're on your own. You need to go to the second or the fourth chapter. And I want you to see something that is interesting. And we'll try to make this more evident as we go. But Chronicles, and I quote Chuck Swindoll. He said, quote, respectfully, Chronicles is the most boring book in the Bible. What do you think of that? Chronicles is the most boring book in the Bible. And you say, why is that? Because it's nothing but genealogies. It's genealogy after genealogy after genealogy. There you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there Jacob had 12 sons. And these 12 sons were considered to be the sons of Jacob. Jacob's name is called Tel changed to Israel. Now they're, they're called the 12 tribes of Israel. And then you get down into Chronicles and it begins to list every one of those tribe leaders and then all those that have come from them. And it's like reading words you've never seen before. It's really challenging, especially for me. And yet I find something that was so interesting. I come to 1 Chronicles chapter 4 and I come down to verse, verse 9, and I see something that's even unusual. You see, in verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all he's doing is listing the tribe head or the family head, the father, and then these are his sons. Here's the father, here's our, his sons, and here's the father, and here are his sons. And then you come to verse 9. And what you see there is that he stops when he says Jabez. 
Now, five sentences in the English language, two verses in your Bible, and then he's back at quoting the genealogies. And you'd almost like to say, is that really, why is that there? And so we began to look at it, and I want you to see it, and we're going to go through it. But I think there's some very powerful, powerful lessons that we can learn here. Now, the first thing we're going to see is that there is the name. What does Jabez's name mean? Is that significant? I'm going to say right now, it is highly significant. And you'll want to know it. Secondly, then we're going to look at his prayer, which is verse 10. And his prayer really comes down to four different parts. He starts out by saying, bless me. Then he says, enlarge my territory or coastline. And then he says, let your hand, God, your hand be upon me. And lastly, that you'd keep me from evil. And then what you find is that the Bible says, the Bible says, God answered him. Now, really, that's how these two verses break down. Now, what I want us to do is look at these two verses, take it as it were phrase by phrase, and I think what you're going to find is that there's some things in there that are just extremely important as we go. Ready? Here we go. Verse 9. Jabez. That's the name. We're going to come back to it in a moment. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. Now, fitting this into the context... This fits in the sense that his brothers, that doesn't necessarily mean his sibling, but the brothers that have been in his lineage, we started with Judah, and then we come all the way down. He says, but Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. Now, what, what you're finding is, is that you have a statement there, but it has nothing to give credence to it. You'd say, then why would you say that? Is there a reason for that being said? How come Jabez, other than these, are more, is more honorable? We're going to find that out in just a few minutes, but we'll stop there. The next thing that you read is simply this. His mother, his mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Now, there's a number of things that we want to see here, and that's going to help you position him in the right era of time. First of all, you want to see what is seen there, and then I want you to see what's not seen there. Now, obviously, what you see there is mom. What you don't see there is dad. You say, so? Well, if you go in the verses prior to this, you're going to find that dad is the one that always names the child, but mom's naming the child. You'd also say that dad is for some reason out of the picture and that mom names the child Jabez. And then she makes a statement that gives qualification to Jabez's name saying, I gave birth to him in pain. All right, let's, let's unwrap this. Let's go back to the father situation. Now, you understand I'm going to make this up. But I want to make this up on purpose because the question that I had right away was, in what time period is Jabez living? And the answer becomes very clear. He's living at the time when they have come off the desert experience, crossed the River Jordan, went up against Jericho, and then also facing Ai, another city. We'll get to that in a second. Now, what am I saying that for? Let's just try to remind ourselves that if I, if I hook something up to this, I might remember it better. Why isn't Jabez's dad listed here? Why isn't it Jabez? Why isn't the father the one that names Jabez? As you know, in the New Testament, Zechariah named John. Now, Why? Okay, we can make up some stories just to get us situated in that time period. Maybe Jabez's dad was part of that unbelieving group that would die in the wilderness before they could cross over the River Jordan in a miraculous way into the promised land. I said, I'm making up a story, but maybe that's where he died. Don't know. But you remember they did cross over the Jordan when it was swollen in a miraculous way. And then they did face the town of Jericho. Now, you remember in that time that God said to them, don't touch anything in Jericho. Don't touch 
anything in Jericho. Leave it there. It's not yours. It's mine. Leave it alone. Then we're introduced to the story in Joshua 7 about Achan. Achan, his name is proper because he would cause a lot of aching. Achan took stuff from Jericho, took it back to his tent, hid it. Then, with unbeknown to Joshua, they were going to go up against this town called Ai. They send 3,000 troops up there. 37 of these people die. Could Jabez's dad be one of those? Don't know. Now, why am I saying this? I'm telling you a story. I'm making up this story, but I'm trying to get you into the place where the time zone is right. It's in that period of time. It's also in that period of time that Joshua will call the heads, the, the, the brothers, if you please, the tribes together, and he'll say, I'm going to divvy up now the land, the promised land, to each one of your tribes. You then give them to your children, divvying them up that way. Now, that's important because you'll see why in a few moments. But you understand it's in that period of time. Now, let me take you back. All we did that for was to say what time period we think now we understand and we'll remember it. Secondly, his mother named him Jabez. Now, if she would have stopped, but she didn't. The next thing she says is saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Now, again, one thing we know is very common is that in childbirth, there's pain. We would also know that that is the result of Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, one of the things that was laid on the woman is that she would bring forth children in pain. It would be a reminder of the curse of sin. Adam would have his, the snake would have his, and she would have hers. And when she had babies, it reminded her of one thing, is that the curse of sin is still upon us. Now, we don't know how much pain. We don't know if it was abnormal pain. We don't know anything except one thing. She was reminding Jabez his name, his name, part of his name means pain. I bore you in pain. But there's something very interesting about Jabez's name because there is a simply like you'd say pain slash hope. Because it's, it's almost as if you should say when you and I have had our children and we look at them and we understand that they were born in pain. It's part of the curse. It's still upon us. But we look at that child and, and some of us have said, I wonder what they're going to become. I wonder what they're going to become. I wonder how they're going to bring such help to others and how they're going to be sustaining the kingdom of God, as we would say. I wonder. You look at them with such hope. Jabez's name is pain slash hope. So she looks at the child and says, that was painful. And she looks at the child and says, now listen carefully. I remember a promise that God gave to Adam and Eve when they walked out of the garden that I would send a redeemer. Could you be that redeemer? So what we're seeing here is that one, she names him. She names him Jabez. She names him Jabez because of the pain it took to bury him. But she's also seeing, is he? Could it be? Is it possible that he could bring that kind of hope? All right. Verse 10. We leave his name. And what we look at now is Jabez cried out to the God of Israel. Pause. What is that saying? Jabez was a believer. A believer in what? Well, who is he crying out to? The word crying out doesn't just simply mean rotating, uh, 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 giving a, 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 a prayer. Crying out means a heart surge. Crying out means a sense of sincerity. Crying out means of something that is of great magnitude. But it's not only that, but it's that where are you and who are you crying out to? And the Bible makes it very clear that he's crying out to the God of Israel. So Jabez, at this point, we don't know how old he is. 
it's very likely that he's of age to receive the property because he's going to tell us a little bit about that. But he cries out to the Lord, the God of Israel. All right, so that's what we see there. Let's look at the next part. Oh, that you would bless me are the first words that come out of his mouth in the prayer. Oh, that you would bless me. I wonder how he prayed it. Oh, that you would bless me. 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 I wonder how he did it. But whatever it was, it's basically in and of itself, it's a vague request. It's so much like some of our prayers today. Oh, Jesus, bless my children. And I wonder if God is saying, in what way? Oh, Lord, bless the pastor. Really? What does that mean? Oh, bless, oh, Lord, bless the missionaries. And I can almost hear God saying, name one. Just name one. But you see, what we're finding is, as he opens this up with this, this plea for God's attention, plea for his, his intervention into his life, he's now begun to become more specific. Are you ready? Here we go. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. The original says something, enlarge my coastline. Now, I understand that because I told you the makeup stories of the time period that he's in. It's at this time, you must understand, when the children of Israel were promised the promised land, and they, that the promised land would be flowing with milk and honey, it would be, in another way, it would be like saying to them who have been in the desert for 40 years, this land is going to be paradise to, for you. In fact, when the, when, the, when, the, when the spies came back, they brought with them grapes that were of amounts greater than I can imagine. Now, here's the point. I want you to know I'm going to give this land to you. Now, the question is, but what about those that are living there? And God very clearly tells us what those people were like. He said that they were the most, he were the most evil people you could imagine. They were vile, they were immoral, they were wicked, they were violent. In fact, God said they have come to the place of being so wicked, so violent, so immoral, that I want them wiped off the face of this earth. Now, let me tell you something. When they have been given this land, it's not like a turnkey. You've been given your key and you walk into your house and it's all there. By the way, it's all there. They didn't have to dig the wells. They didn't have to build the buildings. They didn't have to plant the, the harvest. They didn't have to, they just had to harvest the, what was there. So you understand, but there's one thing more. They had to rid the land of this evil group of people. And God is very specific by speaking of their evil in a dimension that we'd say on a scale to 1 to 10, they would be a 15 to a 20. They would be described in vivid ways that we don't want to talk about today. But what has to happen is that each individual, given that certain segment of land, would have to occupy it. Now notice what it says. Enlarge my territory. Stop again. Is he asking for more real estate? I don't think so. Because God is making it very clear, you have this, you have this, you have this. But what he's saying is, I need to go in and occupy that territory. You see, so oftentimes I think it's very similar to us. God has planted us here at the county seat. God has planted us here in this city. God has given to us, as it were, the responsibility of this area. But what we have to do is go in and claim this by the help of God's Spirit and the servanthood of His people so that we can give to them the good news of Jesus Christ that they might come to know Christ in a redemptive, transforming life. But He's saying, now listen, Father, increase my territory. Enlarge it. In other words, I'm going to go in and I'm going to need you to help me to conquer those that are there so that I can take that which you have promised to me. Are you getting the picture? You see, in a sense, there's going to be some things at the end that I'm going to show you. This is an effective prayer. It doesn't just stop with, Lord, bless me. But it begins to be very, very specific. Are you specific? 
Lord, enlarge my territory. You know, one of the things I pray for, my wife and I pray for, we pray for this over and over again. It's not enlarge our territory, but Lord, let our children and our grandchildren and the future mates of our grandchildren be children that really are committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, I am saying, enlarge my territory. Let each one of my children claim ground for Jesus Christ. Let every one of my grandchildren be instruments in the hand of God to make a, a spiritual move. How are you praying? I oftentimes used to pray, Lord, protect them. As much as I want to, I don't anymore. I just understand this. I, I even don't say, Lord, Lord, be with them. Because I thought, that's stupid. If he's everywhere present, why would I ask him to be with my children? He's with my children. What I want to pray for is that their, their territory, spiritual territory, will be enlarged. So he says, bless me. Enlarge my territory. Now, listen, he's got to go up against the enemy, doesn't he? Now, this isn't a prayer where God says, okay, step aside, my son. I'm going to go in. I'll wipe them out. That's not at all. In fact, that's not the way the Lord works. Because when God gives us a vision... We are then his instruments, his servants, to go in and claim that ground, however that means. What does that mean to us? Well, that, part of it was putting up that building. Part of it is staffing the Awana, DL, staffing Children's Church, staffing the nursery. Because in a sense, part of this all is to help people to come to the place of realizing that there's real, true life here in Jesus Christ. So he says, bless me, enlarge my territory. Now, here's the third part. Let your hand be with me. Let your hand be with me. The hand of God is always speaking about the power of God. You see, it's not me going in and by my wit and my wisdom and by my experience and by my education, I become so smart that I begin to know exactly what to do. I remember so clearly when that building was in, I kept saying, Lord, I don't know. Lord, I can't understand. Lord, send me somebody. And it was so interesting to see how God did that. My wife just ordered a video of those who built the ark. You remember the ark? There, where is that at? Kentucky? And what I saw there was something I could fully ident with, identify with. They were basically saying to do this thing, it's a football and a half long, and it's something that is so far beyond their understanding, and it's not only just building in the outside of an ark, but it's also taking care of every compartment inside. It's taking care of every compartment with its animal inside, and it's just more as you can imagine. And they kept saying, Lord, we don't know how to do this. And they said over and over again, God supplied God supplied, God brought, God did, God brought it about. Now, in a sense, when you look at this, he says, let your hand be with me. Lord, I can't be powerful enough to overpower these Canaanites. I'm not the soldier adequate. And he says, Lord, be the power. Now, you understand what I'm saying. He takes individuals like you and me, as weak as we might see, as, as inept as we might experience, and he wants to do something through you, and that's where Paul very clearly says, because of that weakness, he says, therefore I glory in my weakness that the gift and the power of God and his spirit would be living out through me. Now that's exactly what we're seeing in the New Testament. He's illustrating in the Old Testament by saying, let your hand be upon me. Are you praying that way? Lord, I don't have a clue how this is going to go. I don't know how you're going to bring things together. I don't know how we're going to reach the four corners of this county. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And then I pray, Lord, you do. Bring the right pieces. You know, as I think of this and I think of our generation, my generation that is quickly going to the side, I look at the, the, I look at the, the funeral home and I see some of the people I know and I know some of their ages and I see how they're going by. I'm saying, Lord, the next generation has to be in place. The next generation has to have the same zeal or more so the next generation has to have the same passion to bringing about the workings of Christ, the same passion for the Word of God. Lord, help me to get this next generation in place. And he's doing it. He's doing it. Now, let's go back. Let's go back. Oh, that you would bless me. But let me be more specific, he says. Enlarge my territory. 
thank you for the territory, but Lord, let your hand be upon me. And then he says, keep me from harm so that I will not, so that I will be free from pain. This was interesting. The original, in the original, it doesn't use the word harm. It uses the word evil. Keep me from evil. Keep me from evil. Notice what he's saying. It's, it's about me. I have a tendency. I have a, a tendency. I have a tendency to do that which is other than your heart and your mind. Keep me from evil. You know what? The thing that I pray more, I think, and I just, just put this in front of you. I, I so appreciate Jim Miller's class on staying firm, as we'd say, to the end. Because I am so convinced you can be firm, you can be solid for the majority of your life. But if in those moments, at the end of your life, you choose to be disobedient, it is disastrous. It is disastrous disastrous. Everything you did seems to be overshadowed by what you shouldn't have done. Everything you said and was very accurate and to the point is now shadowed because you have not been faithful to the end. And I think it's imperative that we recognize that as believers in Christ, we've got to realize that every moment, every moment, every moment has got to be understood that if this is my last moment, will this be the right way to end? Now, I am so grateful to God how he forgives. I'm so grateful to God for how he cleanses. I'm so grateful how he can take my, my miserable mistakes and he can bring good out of them. That's what he promised to do. But what I'm trying to say is, Jabez here is saying, keep me from evil. Keep me from participating in evil. Keep me from being one who accepts evil. Stop again. I wish that were true of that Israelite family. They were told to go in and take the land. They were told to go in and, and put to death those who lived in there because of the evil. But what you find is, is that instead of doing what God said to do, they compromised. They made friends with evil. You understand what I'm saying? They made friends with certain people and they intermarried with certain people that they were never supposed to be. When you leave the book of Joshua and you move into the book of Judges, what you find is God's horrendous judgment on the people because they would not stay true to their calling. Our greatest job as individuals, as believers, is by God's grace and by His Spirit and the light of His Word and the company of the believers, stay true today. Stay true tomorrow. Stay true. Because look at what he says. Keep me from evil so that I may be free from pain. Can I tell you something that was interesting? The word pain in the Hebrew he uses his name there, that I might be free of Jabez. What was Jabez referring to? The curse of sin. That I might be free of this. Do you see, now I say this in two ways. It will have a repercussion on my life if I choose to do other than what God wants. But it will have a repercussion on your life too if I choose to be different. Do you realize how, how clear it is when it says no man or woman is an idol island? Do you realize that how you speak, how you live, what you do will affect those around you? Do you realize how often a child looks to their dad, looks to their mom, and sees them as the examples to follow? I just close this scene a minute and just say this. I am so proud of my parents. They have literally laid a wonderful track to follow. As difficult and as hard as old age is, as much as what a old age strips from you, there's still the passion for each other and there's the passion for Christ. They're finishing well. And guess what this boy wants to do? Finish well.
I want to finish well. Let's go back. Oh, that you would bless me. Enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm or evil so that I will be free from pain. And it ends, and it ends. Did you see how it ends? And God granted his request. And God granted his request. Jabez, and the prayer of Jabez. Here's some conclusions. I was just looking at Jabez's prayer, and I thought, can I find three factors for effective prayer from Jabez's prayer? Three factors. Here's three that maybe you'd like to just think about. Prayer is always based on the promises of God. And I think that's, that's true. Because listen, it was because of the promises of God, he said that you're going to go in and you're going to take over this land. It's going to be your land. You will occupy this. Prayer is based on the promises of God. I believe with all my heart, God has given us the promise of reaching our community for Christ. I believe we're seeing the unfolding of it even in these last weeks. I hope Ed stands up next Sunday and tells us exactly what's been taking place in Awana or Steve in Discovery Land. I hope we understand that this is going to be a time and saying it is happening. God is helping us to occupy this area for him and the name of Christ. God promised, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And when we're about his commission, when he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, and lo, I'm with you always until the end of the earth, you see, I already have his hand, his power with us. The prayer, listen to this, prayer conforms the believer to the will of God. It's not God being conformed to us. Do you understand? I think most of us better take a check of our praying because most of the time, most of the time, we have a tendency to pray what we want more than what he wants. Prayer is for me being conformed to his will, not him being conformed to mine. What do you think? I think the third one is prayer keeps the believer from sin that causes pain even in others. We have a Bible study on Thursdays, a men's Bible study, May to 6 o'clock. Men are welcome, but I know it's kind of early. But one of the things we talked about was Peter's slippage. Yeah, you remember when Peter said, I'll never slip, I'll never forsake you, I'll stand with you, I'll die with you. He even pulls a sword in the garden and chops off the ear. You remember that, you remember that, you remember that. But then there's that moment when these little ladies, and I think there's three that you can see for yourself. All they do is say, you're one of them. And in self-protection, Peter reels and says, not to me, until the rooster crowed. And then in Luke, it says, that was the very moment that Peter's eyes and Jesus' eyes connected. There's no other place in the Bible that says that. Why, 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 why did he slip? And then we discussed that together. And one of the things that became very, very clear is that Jesus makes a statement back in the garden. He says, pray, 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 lest you enter into temptation or you fall. And as I look at the situation, Jesus, he gave himself to prayer three different times. But each time he came back, he found the disciples slipping into sleep. You see, prayer, even even though you're tired, you need to be about prayer so that you will recognize that this praying is what aligns me and reminds me that I am not to compromise. I wonder if it was because of his tiredness that he fell. I wonder if it was because of his sleep that he, he went to sleep at the wheel when the girls said, you're one of them. I wonder if one of the greatest things that we've got to get to is, is purposely, daily, finding ourselves on our knees, if it would be, or wherever and however, in such a way, saying, God, I will slip unless you help me. Unless you come into my life, I'm going to slip. Bruce Wilkinson, Bruce Williams, 
my friend who's in Pastor Montana, I'll never forget this. He was bound by alcohol. He would get into the shower in, in the morning, and he'd have a six-pack of, of beer there, and he kept saying, Lord, if you don't step in and help me, I will fall. And I think that's something that we all have to realize, that one of the greatest dangers is that our falling will not only affect us, but it will affect so many around us. And we've got to realize that in that time of prayer, we are very much petitioning God for that moment we will come in contact with, that we will not be giving in to self-protection or pride or just simply the willfulness to sin. I think I learned those three things that would make prayer effective. Let me just say some more lessons. It's very evident because every baby that's born is born in pain. We still live in this fallen world. When I look at Jabez, I see something a little bit more. Jabez's name means pain slash hope. But wasn't that the same with Jesus? His pain was for my, my sin. But in him I have hope. I also find that we can live a transformed life. I love it when he says, expand my territory. You see, and now that's not an ego trip. That's just saying, Lord, you promised. Now expand it. Now I have no idea how God's going to use the church. And I don't know how far it's going to reach. But I keep saying this. It's not about my pleasure. And it's not about my wishes and wants. It's about your kingdom. And it's about your kingdom expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding. Now, Lord, enlarge our territory. That's a good prayer to pray. I finally concluded this. Well, let me just put it this way. As a disciple of Christ, I thought this was very good. One. The curse of sin is forgiven. That's past. The curse of sin is forgiven, obviously, in Jesus. Second, the power of sin is broken. I challenge you to read through the Scriptures and find that where you see, where you see this, you're going to find it to be so helpful. Because so many times we say, I can't help it. I'm an, ad I'm an addict. I can't help it. I just have to do it. I can't control my speech. I'm sorry about that. I can't, I can't, I can't. And the Bible, it makes it very clear that the, not only is your sins forgiven, but the power of sin on your life is broken. And what's nicer is that someday the presence of sin will be removed. Let's wrap it up with three applications or more. One. We can come boldly to God in prayer. That's what Hebrews says. Come boldly, come boldly, come boldly. I love that passage. Secondly, we must learn God's promises so to pray with confidence. I was given a list, and there was three sheets long of God's promises. I wish I'd have printed them out for you. When you know His promises, you can pray with confidence. Thirdly, we're warned of the danger of moral failure. I am so saddened by some of the things that I have in my memory of good men I graduated with that because of a moral failure, they not only affected themselves, they affected their marriage, they affected their family, they affected the church, and the church has had a hard time recovering from it. Do you know one prayer you should be praying? You should be praying this constantly. Lord, keep Pastor Monty and keep Pastor Jim morally straight. Amen? We often involved, we're often involved in the answer to our prayers. He didn't say to Jabez, step aside, I'll clean up and then let you come in. He says, you go claim that territory. And lastly, Jabez teaches the importance of patience. You know, I, I'm almost convinced he didn't go in to his square lot, lay acreage, whatever it was, and in one day, they're all cleaned out and everything's ready to go. It's a process. And sometimes it's our whole life. Be patient. Be patient.
Worship team, please come. Would the rest of you stand and bow your heads with me? <sighs> Father, I, I'm deeply thankful for a person that you slipped in by the name of Jabez. I'm thankful that he looks a whole lot more human than sometimes we want to give credit to those biblical characters. But I thank you that as he brought before you his request in earnestness for your glory, you answered him. I stand here as an individual. I stand here as a pastor. We stand here together as a body of believers in this local community. And we don't doubt in our mind but that you've given to us this territory. And we're not quite sure how it's to come about. But Lord, you have brought it thus far. And I have no doubt that you're going to be faithful for the days to come. For your faithfulness. For your great faithfulness. We thank you. And we say, Amen.